So thank you so much. And this is my title, um, Conflict of Interest and Learning Objectives. I want to review innovations and advances in LDR and HDR prostate brachytherapy and to discuss the future and what we're doing in the American Brachytherapy, Therapy, uh, Brachytherapy Society as initiatives and for training. And utilization has already been the topic. It's declining in the U.S., not everywhere, but in the U.S. And this is what they're saying about this. This was an editorial in Lancet Oncology just this last month by U.S. leadership and cooperative leadership that says, look, it's a 40-year-old technology with advances in external beam. Rectal bleeding rates are zero. There's no level one evidence. Dr. Keyes, of course, could refute that. The paucity of evidence, guiding optimal dose, isotope, Access severe late GU toxicity, and then salvage therapies are better today. And um, obviously, these statements are false. It's picking and choosing data. Um, this is the bully pulpit, pulpit we've been used to in radiation oncology for some time, and it really misses the point. So, these are my skis. Um, my wife says I have a skiing problem. So, I also have a radiation problem as well. I, I like everything protons, photons, IMRT iridium, palladium, cesium. You know, we need choices, we need flexibility. Um, as a multidisciplinary team, we do need everything. We're not the ones that make this decision at the end of the day, our patients do. And this is a beautiful resort, but what if you walked out this morning, they said, one way up, one way down, that's it. You would look for another guide. You would look for, you would have instant mistrust. And as a multidisciplinary team, that goes against what we're trying to um, give. So innovations in brachytherapy that make it better, easier, and safer, um, which ultimately make it more efficient, cost-effective, safe, and personalized. So MRI, the benefits are obvious. It's, it's, it's the gray area we've been talking about. That's not what we use MRI for. We use it to see more. In MRI, you can see the apex and base. You can see the organs at risk. That's what it comes down to. It's, it's markedly better than anything else. And then automation comes back to what Dr. Bianco opened the door to today. It's artificial intelligence. Um, this is a key. With artificial intelli intelligence and automation, we get redundancy, we get consistency, we get quality, we get efficiency, and this yields safety. So let me tell you about this. So two stories. One is the MRI story. In 2017, a series of articles led by Stephen Frank using MRI at every step of brachytherapy for quality assurance, diagnosis, treatment, simulation, contouring, the radiosurgery aspect of it has to do with the precision of it, very personalized. We've been teaching this um, in our workshops for more than five years now. And then the automated aspect of it, the artificial intelligence, the way we take an MRI and we put it into the dorsal lithotomy position. We, um, register it, we contour it, we plan from a library, a library of thousands of previous plans that we know the outcome of as far as cancer control and toxicity. We optimize it, we validate it, and we do our QA checks all in the cloud. And so this comes down to, so let me talk first about how this affects seeds, and I call this MRI-assisted, directed, and automated seed or LDR brachytherapy. And this is a new chapter. The way most teams perform seeds today is, is very dated. It works, but it's dated, and it can be more, um, it, it is inefficient, and it can be improved. So this is a more idealized plan that is realized today, and this is what we teach. So a patient selects prostate brachytherapy. They select seeds. They call you up and say, hey, you know, I've talked to y'all. This is what I want to do. They were a good patient. So we go to the treatment planning. We grab their MRI from their diagnosis. We send it up to the cloud. Comes back in your inbox seconds later uh, with contours. You tweak it a little bit, send it back up. It comes back a couple seconds later uh, with a treatment plan ready to go. You tweak it a little bit, perhaps. You send it back. It gets QA'd against your past experience, against a library of past experiences. Um, and then it gets sent off this, uh, to be manufactured. The seeds arrived and we're in the OR. OR procedure in this setting are literally 30, 30 minutes or so. You present the ultrasound in front of you. you again, you uh, register the MRI to it. Your plan is visually in front of you. You may tweak it a little bit. We call this intraoperative optimization. We perform the procedure. We register the seeds as we go. We know our product before leaving the OR. Patient is discharged that same day, gets an MRI. Again, we see our seeds. 
and we know our product. I want to stop at one point. This is a key point in my experience over the last five, ten years of doing this that you know needs to be shared. This is a communication point with the urologist and with my entire team. This is what's in front of me during an implant. And for the first time, there's no mystery about what we're doing you know, between the legs and stuff like that. This is what you see, our team sees, and, and so we can all interact. It's a communication point and it yields quality implants. So how about HDR? MRI-assisted, directed, and automated HDR. The way most teams, and the way I've done this most of my career, is backwards. I put catheters in, I accept the geometry, and then we go to planning. But there's more forward thinking that we can do today, that we teach today. Again, it starts with the MRI. We auto contour, we tweak it. Seconds later, we have a plan on it based on a library. We know what we're gonna do before going into the OR. In the OR, we do this. We place the needles as we expected. Our cloud was already there in real time. Our catheters are tracked and monitored, and this is what we see. This is the communication point. I can show you exactly what I'm not doing to the external urethra sphincter, what I'm not doing to the GU diaphragm, but I can show you what I'm doing to the mid gland, to the SVs, and so we leave the OR, and then we're off to the races. Patient goes home. So what are the results of this? And we do have results that show that this improves patient outcomes. Stephen Frank, the MD Anderson Group, um, several hundred patients on a phase two study. They studied because they could see more now. Well, what's the effect? And they can, on the right there, you can see there are doses that cause things like bother, urgency, irritability. You avoid those doses, you avoid the side effect. Most importantly, there's the external, uh, external ur urinary sphincter that we can see for the first time now. And he knows in his series, if he protects that area, he calls it the no-fly zone, his, structure, his stricture rate in his perspective database is less than 1%. Uh, we looked at the same thing in my database. This is IRB appro approved uh, patient outcomes in prostate cancer where we have pro, epic CP, and physician toxicity as well as cancer outcome um, over a, a huge longitudinal series of patients. And we've looked at selection, we've looked at isotopes and different ways of doing things, but the bottom line in several papers, the risk of cystoscopy with an MR-guided approach is less, it's one in 200. And the risk of urethra stricture or obstruction is actually less than that in the modern era. So a lesson learned, of course, was in the external urethra sphincter. This is the same guy, same cut. In the past, I would have loaded that area on the left with seeds or HDR catheters and dose. But in this guy, that is not prostate. That needs to be controlled for. It doesn't deserve any dose, and that's what we're doing today. So the net of these innovations is a treatment that's evidence-based, it's innovative, it's efficient, it's cost-effective, incredibly flexible. I love using all different isotopes, depending on the guy in the scenario. It yields a highly personalized treatment that is high value to our multidisciplinary team and to our patients. It has many other applications. I, so on the left is a focal patient I treated. I know that within that yellow cloud, which is 100% of my dose, that there's gonna be a 99% um, kill rate, mitotic catastrophe in the cancer cells in that cloud. That's what we know. On the right is a salvage case. We do that all the time as well for radio-resistant disease. So what are we doing about it? So what is the future? And I believe it's in training and communicating this value to the multidisciplinary team. This is just one tool. We need all tools for our patients, but um, we have a several American Brachytherapy Society initiatives. There's been a dramatic decline in brachytherapy training and residency programs. More than 50% is tragic. And this is, and the reduction in brachytherapy in the U.S. has led to a detriment in cancer survival for cervical cancer patients. So it came with a call to arms. What are we going to do about this? And several initiatives. One is our partnership with the GRU courses and workshops. Um, our brachytherapy schools and workshops, uh, we, we talk about the 310, it's to train 300 t um, teams, a urologist, brachytherapist, in the next 10 years. We're actually in three workshops, we're halfway there, and so 150 teams have come to our workshop. 70% of them are performing more brachytherapy after six months. 
We are sponsoring fellowships. 22 institutions have already signed up in the U.S. Early Career Mentorship, Teleteaching, which really is a nut to crack itself. We have upcoming um, workshops to invite you to. Um, and then this is just an interesting editorial um, published in December of this year in Breaky Therapy just on where we're going nationally but also internationally to in improve the usage, utilization, to increase the awareness. So thank you very much.